welcome everyone. I hope you got a little bit of a brief chance to say hello and meet your fellow guests. And we will have more time afterwards when we will have a chance to have some lovely wine and lovely chocolate and conversation afterwards. And for those coming in, there's there are some seats over here. Yes, so feel free, feel free to... And we're auctioning some off because it's sold out. So somebody hey. comes in later. Um, but we... Uh, and we will have a chance for that conversation. Chip will be here afterwards. And a chance if you have not purchased the book, they're for sale out there. And Chip will sign one for you. I know you all know who Chip is, but let me just say a couple more things. As you all know, he was the founder of an amazing boutique hotel that was at the time the second largest boutique hotel brand in the country. He sold that and then joined on as the modern elder to this little company with three founders at Airbnb. I know no one's ever heard of it. but. Chip, is, this is partly where I first met Chip, was an amazing role there where he was jointly learning with them mm -hmm. and becoming their elder and their coach for their success. And so that was an important part of Chip's professional journey. He has since then founded the Modern Elder Academy, which have, Karen. Karen has information on outside, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about tonight with a a set of programs both in Baja, California, and in soon to be in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And these are programs designed to really help people think about some of the concepts that are in this book and think about what it means to be, to be an elder. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chip is a prolific author. Uh, this is his most recent one, Learning to Love Midlife, 12 Reasons Why Life Gets Better with Age. And Chip, thank you again for coming back to San Francisco oh, to spend an evening with us. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you, everybody, for showing up today. And um, yeah, and actually, I spent a little bit of this afternoon at what is now called the One Hotel, it used to be called the Hotel Vitali, um, which is a place that I felt like I, I, I helped build originally. <laughs> um, and so this neighborhood means a lot to me. So it's great. I'm, I'm thrilled. The last time I spoke at the Commonwealth Club was at the Marines Memorial in 2018 with Brian Chesky, um, the co-founder of and CEO of, of Airbnb. So at that time, I don't think we were, the, the no. location was open here yet. So it's great to see you in the hood here. <laughs> there we go, great. Well, so Chip, why don't we start with this? Give us a little context about how did this book come about? Mm. What, what were you thinking about um, as you were writing your thoughts on it? Well, you know, I mean, when you, I love writing. When I was, just a quick aside, when I was a kid, I told my dad I want to be a, a writer when I grew up. And he said, Chip, uh, writers are either poor or psychotic, and most are both. <laughs> and at age 12, I didn't know what psychotic meant, but it didn't sound good. Um, so I actually left the creative writing magazine that I was like the co founder of in my junior high school. In high school, I took, I took AP uh, English. And I passed AP. So when I went to Stanford, I took not one English class, not a writing class, not an English class, nothing. And it wasn't until I was about 36 years old after I'd started Joie de Vivre and run it for 10 years that um, I was giving a speech about, you know, boutique hotels. And, and this woman in the, in the audience, a woman named Amy Rennert, who's a, a well-known um, literary agent, she came up to me after, the, after my talk and she said, have you ever thought about writing a book? <laughs> and I said, talk to my dad. Um, <laughs> but she said, you have a book inside you. I can tell just based upon, you know, what you just spoke about. And so that's how my writing career started. So when I'm thinking about a book, it's like I get pregnant. There's an idea inside of me and it just starts to gestate. And um, in this case, it was really obvious. It was sort of because I'd spent um, six years uh, developing mo the Modern Elder Academy, which we'll talk about, MEA. And I had spent, we've had almost 5,000 people from 48 countries come to Baja to go to our, our week-long programs. And my God, I just learned so much from everybody who'd come. And, and I realized, my, you know, we are so, as a, as a society, we're just really awful when we think about midlife. There's one word that describes midlife that's attached to it, the brand. It is, <laughs> my God, I... Any company in the world would love to have a singular word <laughs> attached to it. Not that word for sure. And I just really wanted to help people to see that there's an alternative way to thinking about midlife. And midlife being, midlife is, is the stage of life. And I'm going to shut up in a second. No, 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 let you go back. Going. We're here to listen to you. Midlife is the stage of life between early adulthood and later adulthood. 
And how you define early adulthood and later adulthood will define how long midlife is. But I define it as 35 to 75. And that I'm not alone in that. A lot of sociologists now say that. And so it is a long period, and it has a bad brand, and I really wanted to do something about that. And a few weeks ago, someone came up to me after a talk and said, Chip, you're a midlife activist. And I was like, <laughs> okay. That's good. That's what I am now. That's good. So um, you said it, it is associated, unfortunately, with crisis. Yeah. So, But you don't think at all that way, I know. So wh- why, what is it that is wrong with the, that kind of thinking? Well, let's start by saying there's a, a few... A couple pieces of social science that I, I, I want to just sort of bring to the f- front uh, uh, because the book and the Academy are really dedicated to helping elevate some social science out there that a lot of people don't know about. So first of all, um, there's something called the U-curve of happiness. And um, what it shows is that there's a long, slow... Actually, it's probably going to be changing in the next few years because actually based upon the, the recent uh, happiness research that came out in the last week, I mean... It's not like 45 to 50, which has historically been the low point of adult satisfaction, is the low point anymore. Now it's 25 to 30. Um, but let's just say what it's been historically. Historically, from about 45 to 50, from or your early 20s till around 45 to 50, you had a long, slow decline in life satisfaction. And and then you bottomed out. But you didn't like have a like a valley. You just had a, a bottoming out. And then we got happier with each decade after age 50. Um, you know, 50s happier than 40s, 60s happier than 50s, 70s happier than 60s, and women in their 80s happier than 70s. So I didn't know that. I thought if you could survive your midlife crisis, all you had to look to look forward to is disease, decrepitude, and death. I mean, it was n- not very exciting. But um, So that was a piece of social science research I started to learn about. And then Becca Levy at Yale has shown that when people shift their mindset on aging from a negative to a positive they gain seven and a half years of additional life, which is more life than if you stop smoking it at 50 or you start exercising at 50. And for all those Sil- Silicon Valley biohacking tech bros, they have not found any physical intervention for aging that is better than shifting your mindset. So what I really wanted to do was to help people to see that, um, yes, there is 45 to 50 is the low point. But it, maybe it's not a crisis. Maybe it's a chrysalis. Maybe it's a time where, like, if you think about the caterpillar to butterfly journey, um, it is in that mid middle period, the messy middle of that that metamorphosis, that the trans the transformation happens. And so, for me, I wanted to help people to see, like, well, maybe what if midlife is has a purpose, and the purpose is for you to let go of what isn't working and be open to new, what's n- new that you want to actually bring into your life. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a transformational era, as opposed to an era of crisis or an era that is basically presaging, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, a long, slow decline. Um, and I felt really strongly about that because I lost five male friends to suicide um, between 2008 and 2010, three of them who lived here in, in San Francisco, and three of the five of them were entrepreneurs and the you know the great recession really messed them up and but i they didn't really have a lot of didn't have schools or tools or rites of passage or rituals to help them um last thought <clears throat> we have there's a word that we all know adolescence but that word didn't exist until 1904 1904 got popularized and the idea that your teen years were a transitional period between childhood and adulthood became popularized prior to that quite frankly um once you hit puberty you were an adult uh and so there's a word that's starting to get some attention called middle essence and middle essence is the adult corollary of adolescence it's when you're going through hormonal emotional (laughs) physical and identity transitions and yet adolescence has a lot of social infrastructure to support it and to help people through that time and you're going through adolescence together who is going through middle essence together? Where are the menopausal rituals and rites of passage? Um, where are the empty nester rites of passage? Where are, the em- where are the rites of passage for people who are going to actually get divorced or change a job um, or have a health diagnosis that's scary? So we as a society, I think, have got to get better at this, and that's part of the reason I wrote the book. But part of the reason I actually, am, I actually have some confidence that midlife 
if people can start to see that maybe their best years are still ahead of them in certain ways, then I, I think it's really good for society as well as for us. Fantastic. So I'm, I want to uh, have you dig in a little bit more about the, the second scientific thing you mentioned. You know, Becca a, Levy. Yeah. The, well, no, the seven years of. Yeah. Becca, Becca Levy. Becca. Yeah, that, she's from Yale. So yeah. that, that um, is, I, I read that in here and I hadn't heard it before, before reading yeah. the book. It's, that is just an astounding yeah. um, fact. And so why is that? What is it that happens that? Well, if you here, I mean, if you believe, first of all, let's acknowledge that we, we have bad, we have longevity illiteracy. We don't, we're not very good about understanding how much life we have left. If you hear that the average American male dies at age 74, which is accurate, unfortunately, this country has terrible uh, longevity these days. I mean, real, they're, the following countries have better longevity than the U.S. China, Chile, Cuba, Uruguay, Paraguay, Croatia. I mean, that's really interesting, right? Um, Thailand. Those countries have better longev longevity than the U.S. So we in the U.S., if you think you're, you're, if you're 63 like me and you say, oh, men in, in the U.S. die at age 74, I think I might only have 11 years left. But there's all kinds of other factors, including socioeconomic uh, factors, but also the fact that if you, get, if you if I've lived to 63, I'm likely to live till 81, not 74, because of the fact that I've lived this long. So part of Becca Levy's work and showing that when people actually shift their mindset on aging and they actually see the upside of it, they are more willing to invest in their longevity. So they're more willing to actually say, okay, how am I going to live a good life? Um, how am I going to ask the following question? Ten years from now, what will I regret if I don't learn it or do it now? Which is a beautiful question because anticipated regret is a form of wisdom. It gets you off your duff. And so like, okay, I'm going to, as I did at age 57, I learned, started learning Spanish <clears throat> because I was living in Mexico and I started to learn to, to, to surf. I'm not very good at either. <laughs> but, the fact that I asked myself at 57, living in Mexico, what will I regret at 67, gave me the incentive to say, like, I'm going to go learn that. Now, if I thought I was going to die at 67, I wouldn't put any time into it. So Becca Levy's research, um, which is really well um, documented, helped us to see that. And, and Ellen Langer at Harvard has also done work on this and really great work on, on just showing that when you shift people's perspective on aging, you actually completely shift, shift how they see the rest of their life. Okay. And so um, part a, a, a key part of this is, is learning mindset, the mindset. And Carol Dweck at Stanford, her work on fixed versus growth mindsets, fascinating about this. When you have a fixed mindset, you tend to focus on proving yourself and you want to win. And as you get older, if you only will play games, you'll win. Your life and sandbox gets smaller and smaller. And so, you know, I think what I've wanted to do is help people to expand their sandbox and play with others. Um, I have my friend Sark is here in the, you know, Susan Kennedy, who also an author named Sark. She's very playful. Do you know <laughs> oh, someone likes you back there, Sark? You're not the only person. Yes. Yes. Um, she's playful and she's 70 and she's, you know, who knew she was going to be 70? You didn't know you're going to be 70. And, and I, I didn't know I was going to be 63 and a modern elder. But part of what we need to do in life is to realize, my God, that great Gandhi quote, um, learn as if you're going to live forever and, and live as if you're going to die tomorrow or something like that. And I think it's a really beautiful quote because it really does speak to the value of what we can do today to learn and to live. That's fabulous. And, you know, I, one of the things I also appreciated about your book is you're bringing in both research, bringing in your experience from the hundreds, if not thousands, of conversations you've had with people at the MBA, yeah. Yeah. and your own life story through it. Yeah. So it, it doesn't. It feels like a like I'm having a full conversation with you while I'm reading the book. So, oh, thank you. Um, and, and you you talk about um, elements of how to have that different mindset, and one of those is about um, letting go of the your physical being defining who you are. So talk yeah. a little bit about that. Well, I, I think part of the challenge we have in, in the U.S. Uh, let's recognize as a starting point that the most ageist country in the world is the one we're in right now. 
In fact, ageism is the last socially acceptable form of bias. And I think we should, act, I think we should do a, um, a class action lawsuit against Hallmark Cards. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, Hallmark Cards makes fun of us. Yes. You know, 50, 40, I mean, like, like 60, 70. The fact is, the reason why the United States is the most ageist cult society on the planet is because of Hollywood and because of Madison Avenue and because we define growth in the United States based upon our bodies. So, um, you know, I love the fact here in the Bay Area, we have old growth redwoods. We also have old growth humans. <laughs> And but we don't think of growth. I mean, the, old, the growth you have as you get older is this growth right here, your belly. But the fact is, we tend to think of someone. We tend to think of each other based upon our physical structure because that's that's what we see. You know, when it comes to a tree, you see how tall it is, but also its age is inside the tree. It's in the rings. Our tree, our our our, our age are right here. These wrinkles. And so we age externally. And, it, and in a society that defines our bodies and our beauty as our currency, that is part of the reason why we live in a society that is pretty ageist. Because, you know, as we get older, one of the things that does, you know, get less good over time is our body and our beauty. But it's not the only playing field we play on. There's also the heart, our emotional intelligence. That's one. So the book is the subtitle of the book is 12 Reasons Why Life Gets Better with Age." Our emotional intelligence grows with age. There's, it's irrefutable, uh, and it's now there are people out there <laughs> who you can talk to, point to, and say like, "Oh, that guy's <laughs> his his emotional intelligence has not grown with age." <laughs> um, these are averages. Your mileage <laughs> your mileage may vary, um, <laughs> but the bottom line is. Emotional intelligence grows with age. So that's one playing field that we don't really talk about. Someone growing, growing emotionally, growing relationally. Uh, Bob Waldinger's work at, at Harvard is really interesting on this. Um, it's a, a longitudinal study that's been going on for 85 years now. The same group of people, almost everybody's dead, but there's still a few people who are alive. They're all over 100 now. That They've stayed the same group of people in Boston. Um, and what they found is the number one variable for people who actually were healthy, happy, and living a long life in their 80s and 90s was how invested were they in their social relationship in their 50s and beyond. So that's the number one variable. It was not their cholesterol. It was not about their stress level. It was not their actually income level. It was how invested were they in social relationships in midlife and beyond. So yes, emotionally, we get better with age. Relationally, we care more about relationships with, as we age. And yes, we have loneliness as well. Uh, it, it, the whole society, but definitely older people. Um, spiritually, we get more curious, starting in midlife and beyond. Richard Rohr, anybody hear of Richard Rohr? So Richard's on our faculty at MEA, teaching in July uh, in Santa Fe, and he's a student. At 78 years old, this man came to Baja to actually go to Lynn Twist's workshop at MEA, and oh my God, was it, what a what a what a revelation to see that man. Um, for those of you who don't know him, he's a Christian mystic and a Catholic priest and um, wrote a book called Falling Upward, which is the best book I've ever read on spirituality in the second half of your life. Um, long story short is he says that the first half of our life, our primary operating system is our ego. And it's around midlife that the primary operating system shifts to the soul. But no one gave you operating instructions. <laughs> and so the idea that we get more spiritually curious is another playing field that gets better with age. Um, wisdom can get better with age. It, you know, you have to learn something and to metabolize it to know that you've gotten some wisdom out of it. So long story short is there's a lot of things that get better with age, but we live in a society here where the only playing field we tend to look at is the, your face, your body, etc. cetera. Um, and um, so... That's one of the reasons why I said one of the, one of the chapters is about um, uh, one of the 12 reasons why like life gets better with age is when you relieve that your body no longer defines you. And that's a, that's a good feeling when you don't feel like you have to do it for others. Mm -hmm. I have to look like this in order to attract someone. Uh, you know, you do it for yourself. It, it's not about short-term vanity as we get to this age. It's more about long-term maintenance because this is a rental vehicle. <laughs> we were issued this rental vehicle upon birth, 
And as we get more mileage on it, it has more dents. The chips, the paint's chipping a little bit. And what it, what it looks like on the outside doesn't matter as much. What it feels like on the inside is what matters. So That's fabulous. So I just want to remind folks, I'm only going to ask two or three more questions, and then we'll open it up to your, your questions. And we're not going to do cards, so there's a microphone back there if you want to ask questions. Feel free to start thinking about them, and we'll have a plenty of time to talk to Chip. So I want to delve a little bit more into the, the closing component of what you just mentioned around spiritual life because I had not expected you to be talking about that as mm. explicit. I don't know why, but it was a um, kind of yeah. caught me as a, that's um, an important component of how mm. people think about life, particularly at, at the, um, as you're yeah. uh, aging. But t talk a little bit more about your own journey through that and kind of how you articulate to others about how, how they should be thinking, because you're not preaching to people. Oh, no, yeah, I don't have a, there's no, there's no denomination attached to this. I was on the board of Glide, Glide Church here for 10 years. So I was a regular Sunday celebration guy going with Janice and Cecil. Um, but um, no, I, I, I don't think, you know, I, as we get older, um, we get more curious about, you know, the mysteries of life. And uh, Dacker Keltner, if you've ever heard of Dacker, he's on our faculty at, at MEA. He teaches twice a year, once a year in Santa Fe, once a year in in, um, in Baja. Um, in fact, he lives part-time in Baja within walking distance of our campus. <laughs> when the world's leading expert on awe lives in your neighborhood, you know you're living in the right place. So yeah, but the Baja campus, both campuses are beautiful. Um, Dacker taught, he, in his book last year that came out called Awe, um, he studied what what is it about awe that opens people up to something bigger than themselves? And he looked at the eight most common pathways to awe, and um, so and number one on the list was moral beauty. What a surprise! It wasn't nature. Nature was number three on the list, and collective effervescence was number two on the list. Um, the idea of in, in being with other people, whether it's dancing or it's um, being at Cecil preaching at at Glide or I was on the you know founding board member of Burning Man, being on the playa at Burning Man. There's a lot of collective effervescence. Um, so I think that what awe does is it opens you up out of the ghetto of your, your ego and your mind. And spirituality is, to me, and, and the idea of something bigger than yourself is, I, I think, a really important part of what it means to get older. Uh, again, as Richard Rohr says, if you move from the ego to the soul, you're moving in a direction of um, trying to connect with others and, and, you know, all kinds of others, including animals and, and you know, and plants. And, and so the, the premise of being at a later stage in your life and, and seeing that the mysteries of life are something that you don't have to solve, but you can marvel at it, mar 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 marvel at them. You can, you can move from the weight of the world to the wonder of the world and be in a place where you actually have such a almost childlike sense of wonder. Um, and I think that's what we're meant to do as we get older. Uh, and it's hard to do that when you have spent your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s being very, you know, and I'll speak for myself, being on a treadmill, being very linear, and one of the things that I did during COVID that I, I have started to do again is on my calendar, I put three hours a day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, from 2 o'clock till 5 p.m. every day. I would drive somewhere in nature because it, during COVID, the modern elder academy wasn't open. There was nobody there. And so I would take my dog, Jamie, and we go for a walk, and I, and I put it on my calendar as spying on the divine. <laughs> and, my, and so from 2 to 5 p.m., three days a week, I would go out into nature and I would ask the question before I went into nature, nature, what do you have to teach me today? And that's how I would do it. And I, so, so the idea of spirituality can, can show up in all kinds of forms. There are a lot of people, Phil Pizzo, uh, who I love, I write about him in the book. Um, he was uh, the dean of the Stanford Medical School. Um, he started the Stanford Distinguished Careers Institute. Um, Phil was a good Catholic boy. You know, his first kid in his family to go to to college, a, Italian family. And at 77, Phil realized that what he really wanted in his life was to integrate his spirituality that he'd always had, 
but also with his, his academia. But he was also interested in Judaism, and he he joined a synagogue a couple years earlier. And at seventy seven, he became he started he went to rabbinical school, and he's in rabbinical school now. So that's not unusual. Eric Erickson, the developmental psychologist, talked about the eight you know um, uh, different um, stages of life, and he said the eighth stage of life, seventh stage of life is was midlife, and the question was generativity, how you generate things through you especially for younger generations, versus stagnation. And the eighth stage of life um, is integrity versus despair. Integrity is the last chapter of this book. Uh, it really speaks to this. How do we not just grow old, old, but how do we grow whole? How do we integrate all of the different parts of ourselves, like Phil did, saying at 77, I want to go become a rabbi, and I want to actually study to you know, uh, and go to rabbinical school. So I, I think that the people I most admire who um, have a pro-aging perspective on life, not an anti-aging perspective, because the world is full of anti-aging industrial complex uh, projects, products which are mostly anti-women products. Let's be honest; um, they're sort of made, made to make women feel badly about their natural form of aging. F people like Phil who have a pro-aging perspective, like wow. I can discover more. I th those are the people I'm learning from. So that's great. So um, uh, last question I'm going to ask yeah. before opening it up. So and then people can start lining up if they want to ask any questions. Yes. So um, we've talked a little bit about the Modern Elmer Academy, but yeah. haven't described what it is. So yeah. I want you to both. Um, I haven't had a chance to attend, but everyone I know who's attended yeah. tells me they come back a totally changed person, and it was the most amazing experience they've had. So yeah. when I hear that, I have to so <laughs> tell me what this is and how this come about and, and yeah. tell us about it. Well, when I was at Airbnb and they started calling me the modern elder, I was like, oh, I don't, <laughs> I'm no modern elder. I'm 52 years old. <laughs> and I'm like, well, Chip, the average age here is 26. Like, you are a modern <laughs> elder. So an elder is a relative term. And yes, I was not elderly. I thought that's what they were saying to me. But they said, no, you're an elder. You're, but you're a modern elder. A modern elder is someone who's as curious as they are wise. That's what they said to me. I was like, okay, I'll be that. <laughs> the perfect alchemy of curiosity and wisdom. And then they said, it's not about reverence, Chip. It's about relevance. And you know how to be relevant. <clears throat> so that is what led me to having a... You can go around this way if you want. Okay. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of people to go by. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so when I was finishing my full-time work at Airbnb, four years of that, and then went to three and a half years part-time, um, I went down to Baja uh, to write a book called Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder. And um, while I was writing that book, I went for a run on the beach one day, and I had a Baja aha. <laughs> I had an epiphany. And the epiphany was, why don't we have midlife wisdom schools? Why don't we have a place where people can... Um, reimagine and repurpose themselves. Because if you're 54 years old, which is the average age of the people who come to MEA, to Modern Elder Academy, and you're going to live till 90, 54 is exactly halfway between 18 and 90. But not many 54-year-olds think they're halfway through their adult life. So how do we help people to navigate their transitions in midlife and later, um, cultivate their sense of purpose, and learn how to own their wisdom, how to understand what have you learned along the way, um, and how can you share it with others? And so MEA came about as a wild ass idea. Ben, who's here in the front row, was like, like with me along the way, and um, and it was in one of the first beta cohorts. Um, and there's probably a few. How many people here are MEA alums in the audience? There's a f there's a few of you here. Um, and Kiara, who is I think out there. I don't know if she's in here. Um, right there she there. is. Oh, look at that. I guess you can hear out there. Um, <laughs> Kiara, Kiara is a great person to talk to about not just our programs, but also our, our um, the private group things we do, um, where we have you know pri private groups, whether it's a peer-to-peer -peer group like Young Presence Organization, YPO, um, or it's a company. Um, they come and do programs. <clears throat> so MEA came about um, six years ago um, with that as the premise. How do we help people to reimagine and repurpose themselves? And uh, you know, with almost 5,000 alumni now from 48 countries, I know it's a, it's a movement. There's 26 regional chapters around the world. Um, and I think if I can learn, if I've learned a couple things from this, it's, not, it's number one is 
people um, people often in midlife and beyond think that they are abnormal because they're going through things and they're not talking about it. And this is particularly true for men. Women are so much be- much more socially adept and socially socialized to know how to take care of e- each other. Um, but you know, as I learned with my five male friends who, who took their own lives, they weren't talking about stuff. So how do we create an environment where people can actually talk about what they're going through and realize they're not the only one who is going through it? Um, how do you learn how to become a beginner again? Uh, the, the, one of my co-founders, Christine, she's, she's like the best experienced designer I've ever met. So she, there's all kinds of wild stuff we do during the week, like learn how to, like people are baking bread with each other and, and then serving it to each other. And it's like, well, that sounds stupid, Christine. I'm like, why would anybody come here? To, but it's like, it's, it's part of the ritual. It's part of the experience of collaborating and, and doing something you might not have done before. How do you actually learn how to surf if you want to do that? Or learn how to horseback ride? Or learn improv? Or learn to juggle? Because our process of, at any age, learning something new and becoming a beginner is the gateway for your curiosity and openness to new experiences. And curiosity and openness to new experiences are directly correlated to living a longer, healthier life as well. So... Um, over half the people who've come to MEA have been on some kind of financial aid that we've given them. <clears throat> so it's a diverse collection of folks. Um, uh, and yeah, we because of its growth, we have a 2,600-acre regenerative horse ranch in Santa Fe where we're opening um, in about a month. Uh, and very excited about that with everybody from Elizabeth Gilbert from Eat, Pray, Love being there, Richard Rohr teaching, Michael Franti, the musician, Dacker's teaching there, et cetera. So. And you can learn more about it. Out you can learn more about it. That's, yeah, especially the private programs. I mean, I really, I want to just emphasize that when we have, we have a group coming and, and a woman who's celebrating her 50th birthday and the way she wanted to celebrate her 50th birthday with some friends was to actually take over one of the retreat centers and have go through the program with her friends as a 50th birthday thing. And, and so it's, and leadership teams love it because one of the things I think we need to say, let's spend my last thought and then we'll go to the questions. We're living in a society where knowledge has been commoditized. You know, it was in 1959 that Peter Drucker coined the term knowledge workers and the, the you know, San Francisco is full of knowledge workers. But back in 1959, no one had any idea what he was talking about <laughs> because no one had ever seen a computer before. I mean, the, the average size of a computer was the size of this room. And so he said knowledge workers will someday rule the world. And he was right. And by the 1980s, there was knowledge management and knowledge management pra- practices. But all of the knowledge of the world is in this little machine now. And with chat, GBT, and you know, AI, it's more commoditized than ever before. So we are moving out of the knowledge era and into the wisdom era. And so companies... And organizations and us as individuals have to learn how do we cultivate and harvest wisdom. And we need to know that as a society as well. And so if somebody wants me to talk more about wisdom and you know, one of my favorite topics, I can do that in the Q&A. But I'm going to shut up now and go to the Q&A. <laughs> Great. So if you Thank you. Tell us, tell us your name uh, and then feel free to ask us a brief question. Thank you. My name is Jonathan Hoyt. Great to be here. Um, you are, you've done a lot of experience design work. That's kind of the thing you've done for 30 years. Is there, at Modern Elder Academy, is there an experience that you feel like particularly just opens people up to this insight? <laughs> and I'm just wondering if like, if there's like an aha moment that seems to occur with people there, like what is it? Um, wow. Uh, there's a, something that immediately comes to mind. I'm gonna, so I'll tell you something that we do. And Christine, who, as our experience designer, doesn't love me talking about it publicly because you have to understand context, but I'm going to describe it anyways because you asked such a precise question. I think one of the most important things we need to do, we live in a society in which we get to know each other from the, the outside in, right? We see each other, we judge each other based upon the outside, and then maybe if we're lucky, over time, we get to know people on the inside. There's a guy named Aaron, uh, Aaron Rodgers. No, Aaron, uh, Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> Not that guy. <laughs> Aaron Taylor, who used to actually play football with the Green Bay Packers with Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Taylor, African-American, uh, University of Notre Dame, uh, you know, first-round draft pick. Um, 
and he's got two Super Bowl rings. He's on our he's on our faculty. He says that as a society, we're really good at the first level, the first vault of communication, the facts of our lives. And we're pretty good at the second vault, the, the stories of our lives. But we're not very good at the third level, the essence of who we are. And, and we don't talk from that place. I just got shivers and goosebumps talking about that. So what we really want to do in the first 24 hours when people come to a workshop that usually has about two dozen people in it is we want them to go to the third vault. So we do a lot of things that help with that. You know, we ask, you know, the first night, you know, if you really knew me and you fill in the, you say your name and fill in the blank. And we do a lot of work the next morning on, um, you know, the space between stimulus and response, Victor Frankl's work um, from Man's Search for Meaning. We talk a lot about mindset. But by the first afternoon, the first full day afternoon, we do an exercise that helps people to understand the mindsets they have that they want to get rid of. And, you know, if we didn't do all the preparatory work, this, the thing I'm going to tell you now would sound crazy. But basically, people go to a part of this of the, the meaning space, and there are about three or 400 um, name tags there, all printed. Not, not all of them, actually. About a, a quarter of them are empty, so that someone could actually write a mindset or identity there. And all of these name tags have mindsets or identities there like I have to be the hero or um, my best years are behind me or I will never meet my soulmate or I hate my body or I drink too much or whatever it is there's all these different name tags and at this point you know less than 24 hours into the workshop each person takes between three and six and they slap them on their chest and as a way of owning a mindset, an identity, an archetype, a way of thinking that they want to get rid of. And then um, once everybody's got them on their chest between three and six, we do, you know, you're about that far apart from each other. You look into each other's eyes for about 10 seconds. Then you look at each other's one-on-one. -on -one. You look at that person in front of yours, name tags. You go back to the eyes and then you give each other a hug, um, and then you move on to the next person. By the end of that exercise, with having do that, doing that with every single person in the room, oh my God, have we come to a place where you realize you're normal? <laughs> Everybody has mindsets. Some of you, some of those mindsets, a person put. Oh, I was not. I, that's true of me too. And no one. This whole thing is silent. You point to it. It's like because you didn't. You were scared to put that on, but someone else put it on. And then we end up out at the, the beach and, uh, and a fire pit on the beach. And each person puts into the fire the thing that they're ready to let go of. Because the first of our ha half of our life is about accumulating. And the second half of our life is about editing. And it is in midlife that you need to do the great midlife edit and let go of the things that are just not serving you anymore. And so each person says what it is, throws it in the fire, and then turns around and says, like, and here's what I'm replacing it with. So in terms of experience design, and then right after that, people go into a, uh, a sound bath restorative uh, yoga uh, class and we have dinner. But I will tell you, that exercise um, is the exercise, in my opinion, that opens it up for the week, 24 hours into it, into a five-day retreat, where people say, like, okay, <laughs> the point of no return. <laughs> um, and it's powerful. So thank you for that question. I don't usually talk about that um, because it's, you know, if, you, if you're coming to a workshop, now you know what's going to happen, you know, 24 <laughs> hours into a workshop. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Peter Dickstein, and uh, thank you for this talk. It's amazing. Um, I split time between Santa Gray, is what we call it, and in, in, Santa in Mexico. Gray. <laughs> and yeah, there are a lot of older people in San Francisco. In yeah, so you're in a good market. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just wanted to read you something that I – came across the other day. It's pretty short. Um, and I don't know who, this, who wrote this, but he says, my dad lived into his 90s and outlived all of his friends. He always exercised and was mentally acute you know, his whole life. On his 90th birthday, I asked dad, don't you wish you were 21 again? His reply was the wisdom of the ages. He said, no, I want to be 60 again. 
uh, those were the best years of my life. I was retired and fit, had financial freedom. Yeah. All my friends were still alive. In my 20s, I had no money and still so much toil and worry and heartache ahead of me. So I just, yeah. I'd love to hear your response. Yeah. Um, so the U-curve of happiness research, which is not, not everybody agrees with it, but it, generally it's pretty well respected and it's global shows that, yeah, between early 20s and 45 to 50, we sort of, you know, there's a long so decline. And then 50s are happier. And I, I loved my 50s. My late 40s were awful. I hated my late 40s. I actually had suicidal ideation myself, never did anything about it. But in the book, I do talk about my experience of driving to the Golden Gate Bridge, ready to jump. Um, and I called my friend Vanda. And she said, pull over to the side. And I did. And we talked, and then Aretha Franklin came on singing Amazing Grace. Oh my God. True story. Oh, <laughs> it's like, it's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. Clarence the Angel came down <laughs> to Jimmy Stewart. So thank God I didn't go and do that. And thank God I got to my 50s because I loved my 50s. 63 now. 60s have been r up and down generally, but I have stage three prostate cancer, so that hasn't been easy. Um, and uh, so what I can see is that to be in your 50s, 60s, and 70s and to have all of that wealth of life experience, our painful life lessons are the raw material for our future wisdom. So all those painful life lessons in our earlier life has made us wiser and made us much more discerning about how you spend your time and who you want to spend your time with. And to have that level of personal understanding of yourself when you're still healthy enough in your 50s, 60s, and 70s, and, and beyond potentially, to do just about anything. Um, and that's that, you know, that a lot of freedom. Also, when, one of the nice things about being in your 60s is you may start having some time affluence. You know, you may have some time back in your life, especially if you had kids, especially if you were a caregiver for your parents and, and they've passed. You know, I'm 63 and both my parents are still living. Uh, they're 86. Um, but neither one is, neither one's infirmed, um, interestingly. So um, I think that the idea, I, the, where I think the Eucharist of Happiness has it wrong, it's like a smile, but I think the last part of the smile is a turned down smile, <laughs> meaning I think the last two, three, four years of your life can be really rough for all kinds of obvious reasons. But Laura Carstensen at Stanford has actually shown the opposite. She's actually shown that the less time you have left in your life, the more you are focused on the very moment you're in. And the more, the less you're focused on the future, the more you're focused on the present moment. Generally speaking, the happier you are. So, um, yeah. So we have more questions. So one of the rules that we have in this room is that we do boy and girl. So we've had two boys ask questions I'm so a... far. And we've got Sarah. Great. All right, Sarah. Um, like you, Chip Lindt. And, and we, we have to have, you know, non-binary, too. We have <laughs> yes, to... absolutely. And, and let me say one of my favorite words that I've, I've coined in the book is... It's not about being gender fluid. It's about being age fluid. Hmm. So um, before we, Sarah said, yeah. when you're age fluid, you are not defined by your chronological age because in the next five or 10 years, they're going to, social science is going to show us, I'm sorry, physical science is going to show us you have a chronological age, but you have a biological age. You have a cognitive age. You have a psychological age. Your, your liver has an age. And for some of you in this room, it's not very good. Um, <laughs> your kidneys have a different age. So age fluid is different than being ageless. When someone call, says to you, oh, you're ageless, they're basically saying to you, age is a bad thing. And that's an anti-aging message. So I like being age fluid because age fluid means you, are, you can be younger or older than your current age, and your age is just a costume that you can put on and take off. So... Take it away, Sarah. I love that. That's great. I'm Sarah Ellis Conant. We have a table outside, a plan coaching. So um, that's part of why I'm here. But we share a dear friend in Lynn Twist. Yeah. And she talks about the distinction between 
change and transformation. Yeah. And it <clears> sounds <throat> like what you're creating at Modern Elder Academy are experiences for transformation. And I'm wondering what helps it stick after people leave that beautiful retreat environment, yeah. the the <coughs> collective effervescence. Um, how does how do you keep yeah. those insights alive? So a couple couple thoughts there. Thank you. Um, so uh, first of all, I, I we talk about change change and transition and, and transition slash transformation. Change is <clears throat> change is something change happens in your life when it's external to you. It's situational and circumstantial. Um, and so if you change your boss or change your spouse, it's it's possible two years later you'll be complaining about the new boss and the new spouse <laughs> because it was external. And transition or transformation is when it's not situational or circumstantial. It's actually when it's psychological or spiritual. And something has changed inside of you. So therefore, the pair of glasses you have is different. So that is a, f a starting point, I would say. <coughs> Secondly... Um, you know, I was, you've heard about all the boards I've been on. So I was on the board of Glide. I was on the board of Burning Man. I was also on the board of the Esalen Institute for 10 years. And I used to teach there. And I love Esalen. And you're in an Esalen workshop. There's no curriculum. It's just like it is whoever your teacher is. And so it's not really a school. Um, it's a, an amazing place. It has a strong ethos. But it can be very different based upon who's teaching you that week. And you don't bond with a collection of people and then stay in touch. So you go to an Esalen workshop, you leave, and he's like, oh, my God, I feel so good. And then a week later, you're like, oh. Like, and you don't have really a touchstone. You don't have a workbook that you brought with you, which we have workbooks at, at MEA. You don't have a cohort that's going to do a Zoom call two weeks after you've come home. You don't have a regional chapter um, that actually you can stay in touch with and have conversations with. Um, you don't have alumni programs. And so the thing that keeps it going is the fact that there's a very active alumni program that actually supports people when they come home. Uh, and that's really critical. Yes. Hi, I'm Rick Reeder. I've got uh, actually two questions. Actually, Hopefully. go ahead and move it up just so you don't have to. There you go. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Ah, Rick Reeder, a couple questions. Hopefully it'll be quite quick. Uh, first, uh, influences. Did you go through EST? Have you checked Scientology? Uh, <laughs> did you go to Esalen? Uh, uh, Swami Vikananda? <laughs> so, um, and, uh, the, the second question is, yeah. okay, once you get to a certain age, now what? What do you do now? No more work. Yeah. Well, um, so in the first question, uh, yes, I've been going to Esalen for over 40 years. But everything else you mentioned, I have no association with it. Don't know anything about Est or Landmark. or um, I have been to Mahakumala, which is 100 million people at the Ganges River in, in, in India. Um, it's the largest r devotional ritual in the world. But I'm not Hindu, but I wanted to experience it. Um, so, no, my, my lineage, you know, I was an Episcopalian. Um, that I, I grew up with that. And quite frankly, we went twice a year at Easter and Christmas. And that was about it. So I, I, I didn't grow up with a whole lot of um, uh, religious or spiritual curiosity. In terms of your second question, um, you know, uh, uh, the development, de developmental psychologist um, Eric Erickson said that as we get older, <clears throat> The most important sentence we can consider in our lives is, I am what survives me. And what he meant by that was to say that it is no longer about you and what you're doing. It's about what you pass on to others. And so it, your question was really about like, well, now that I've graduated from work or now that I'm no longer doing the things I used to do, um, how can I feel not youthful, but useful? And to feel useful means you're passing something on to other people. And so the most important thing I can say to people who are older and have time in their life is how are you using that time? The average American retiree watches 47 hours of TV a week. That is not useful. And that is not passing on anything to anybody else. Uh, hi, I'm Kelsey Canadler Perry. I work at Road Scholar. Um, and Road Scholar used to be Elder Hostel. It used to be yeah. Elder Hostel. Yes. And I was wondering, first, a real quick question is, what's the ratio of men to women at MEA? 
Yep, ratio is about sixty-two uh, per sixty-three percent women. Okay. So mostly, mostly women. So you touched on like briefly how men don't talk as much, and so they don't talk about their feelings. They have probably you know higher rates of depression and in, in um, middle and later in life. So I was wondering um, what you've learned about men versus women through MEA, and how we can get men to talk more and how you attract men to come and talk because that's what a, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming there's a lot of talking there so just to kind of yeah. talk about the gender no it's beautiful disparity. um and uh so by the way the uh association the american society of aging uh is here in town right now which is why Ke why kelsey's here um and i'm doing the closing keynote uh tomorrow which is exciting um so uh yes men are not socialized but men get I think maybe more out of the program because it's uh, yeah, if you can get in the common spouses help and friends help and, and, but you know, the, the key is, um, first of all, what is it that men are facing in, let's say in their fifties that because our average age of people who comes in their fifties versus women then, and this is social science research, but it's also what we've seen in our surveys with, uh, MEA alums for women, it's invisibility for men, it, it's irrelevance. And so, it, interesting. And so for men, talking, I mean, like the last thing a man wants to say is like, I'm ir irrelevant. Um, women can laugh and talk about in, being invisible. And some women say like, thank God. You know, it's like, I, I, you know, I can now be a, as one of the, our, our MEA alums uh, and, a, and a faculty member says, I can now be a sniper um, because I'm invisible. Um, and she's a radical. She like is like, you know, um, so... But for men, for a lot of the men, what the challenge is for them is women have juggled. They're, women are much better at multitasking. And in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, they have multiple roles. Co uh, Connie Zweig's book, um, uh, The Inner Book of uh, something of, of Aging, I can't remember what it's called, but it's From Role to Soul. Um, y y earlier in life, these women have lots of roles. Men have two roles often. It's the role of being the provider for the family, and it's their work. And therefore, when they actually get into their 50s and now start feeling irrelevant or are going to be retiring, they are lost. So for, so what we've really tried to do is build a, a very collegiate set of MEA alums who are, have men talking to other men about this. And we have yet to have men's workshops. We've had LGBTQ workshops. We've had black modern elder workshops. We've had Spanish speaking workshops. And we've had lots of women's workshops. But no men's workshops yet. We are now scheduling 2025. And we're going to have a few men's workshops. Because I think for some men, it's actually going to be more comfortable talking with other men about the things that they're feeling than it is actually doing it with women. Um, so thanks for the question, Kelsey. Hi, Chip. Joel Shapira. Last week, you presented to the University of Chicago, the Leadership S in Society group, and you referenced a phrase, longevity literacy. Mm. And it's a, something I know you've written and talked yeah. about a lot. And I, I, my question is, it's a phrase that right now tends to be more about from a financial services yeah. framework. And my question is, how do we expand the meaning of longevity literacy, and how do we make it more of an intergenerational conversation? How do we help young adults mid-age adults, older adults, all have a better understanding of what it means to be to live longer and have increased health span. And how to influence it. Yeah, there's, there's lifespan, there's health span. Health span is, you know, how you're living that longer life. Um, well, I'm really proud that we have a, you know, a partnership with Blue Zones. And so Dan Butner um, taught with me last year in Baja, and we're now doing four Blue Zones workshops a year. And, and Blue Zones, I mean, like the Netflix you know, documentary for, for, I mean, it went big time and that's all about longevity. It's about studying the five, for those of you who don't know it, studying the five places in the world that have the greatest number of centenarians per capita. What are the commonalities? And the commonalities are not stem cell regeneration and it's not um, taking ice cold plunges uh, <laughs> and it's not about working out in the gym. Um, you know, Brian Johnson in Venice Beach spending $2, two million dollars a year on his body to actually try to actually show this. No, the people who have long longevity literacy in those places, then they don't have longevity longevity literacy because they don't they just do things. It's very natural. It's about their diet. It's about their social life. It's about natural walking. It, they they so. I think I'm I'm encouraged that 
Blue Zones has po gotten popularized. I'm encouraged that the the kinds of people who showed up at our Blue Zones workshop last year were of all ages. We had people as young as 28 in that workshop and as old as 80, 87. Um, and the guy who's 87, Jim Flaherty, learned how to surf while he was there in Baja. <clears throat> and he has now become our mascot for our Blue Zones workshops. Um, but I think also something that we started at MEA is called Generations Over Dinner. <clears throat> and they're Jeffersonian dinners where you bring, you bring multiple generations to a table together to talk about solving problems in the world or purpose or love and relationships. And we've had as many as seven generations at a, at a, at a dinner table together. And it's just so powerful. And so <clears throat> I think helping us to realize that wisdom is moving in di two directions today. It is not just from old to young. It is from young to old as well. And we can all learn from each other. So thanks for the question. Yes. Hi. Yeah, my name is Pam Strayer. And um, I have a, a curiosity about loss and how all, I mean, this is all like lovely, optimistic, wonderful, you know, creative, positive thinking. But, you know, I just buried my best friend who was 81 on Monday. Yeah. Uh, I had Thanksgiving dinner with a <clears> woman <throat> who was getting a Christmas tree to cheer up her husband who just lost his five best friends in two weeks mm. just from old age. And the pandemic, you know, we all became poisonous to one another in a certain way. And then I had two really super close male friends that I thought w would be my elder friends. And they both kind of spun out into like weird, weird places, um, which ended the friendship. Yeah. They became sex crazed, basically. Um, and they started <laughs> doing sexting at, sites. At that age? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, or, or they went to the Philippines and decided to get Oy. together with someone Oy. who had five children so, and was a, so your yeah, or, so your question is about grief loss and grief yeah. and how to <laughs> these are yeah. radical changes no I know one or it's not really the result of one's own path yeah. or efforts so let's start by saying the U curve of happiness in terms of people getting happier after fifty is not because their circumstances in their life are better. What we have to learn after 50 is how to metabolize loss and grief and disappointment. <clears throat> and also how to not sweat the small stuff. You know, as when we're younger, um, we are not at, as good at being able to metabolize emotions mm -hmm. and, and metabolize situations. And we also think things are going to, you know, whatever's going to happen to you is just going to be, you know, it's going to be a curse for you for the rest of your life. But what I hear, hear you saying, and I completely agree with, is if the grief and the loss means you feel alone, that is awful. And that is something we have to work on as a society. It's part of the reason the UK created a minister of loneliness. Mm -hmm. It's part of the reason that Viv Vivek uh, Murthy, the Surgeon General in the United States, has shown that Loneliness has a more toxic effect on um, health than does smoking. Who knew? Um, so the grief and the loss that leads to someone feeling lonely or, or, fe or feeling somehow aberrant, like, you know, I, there's something wrong with me because that, that is what we have to work on. And I mean, part of the reason MEA exists is also because I believe deeply in social wellness Physical wellness is, you know, start, you know, wellness, illness starts with the letter I and wellness starts with the letters we. And we, we tend to talk about wellness in the United States. We talk about Pelotons. We, we talk about, you know, your sleep, your diet, your exercise. You know, people should get rid of their Pelotons and just go for a vigorous walk with their best friend. Mm -hmm. Because quite frankly, that's going to have a better health effect on them because they're getting a twofer. They're getting the physical thing, but they're also getting the social and the relational piece. So I hear you, and I think that that's something we as a society have to look more at. And we need to talk about social wellness. So yeah, and I think just one more point at that is that everyone talks about how your wellness depends on your social life. and I don't know that people say that. Well, you said it earlier about the wellness when you're aging depends on your social 
the, the best indicator well, is I, your social connection. Well, I, yeah, you're right. I say, I did say that when in terms of people living longer, lo their longevity, but when people talk about wellness in the United States, they are rarely talking about social wellness. They're talking about personal wellness. Like, right, but you're saying that socially, having a good social network in old age is the key to uh, longevity and well-being. Investing in friendships right. and thinking of friendships as a practice. So, you know, for a lot of people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, they are so blind, they have blinders on that they, they actually atrophy their friendship muscle. But I hear what you're saying, which is, you know, as you get older, if your friends are sort of dying and they're begin to, or they're becoming sex crazed, you act, you actually have to then figure out how am I going to make some new friends? And yeah, it's and that's the topic I really was looking forward to hearing about. So, so in terms of, so the, the question then is, how do you make more new friends? Yeah, you've got a whole collection of people here tonight, <laughs> and there's a whole there's yes, there's a whole chapter in the book on that too. Okay, so. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And I thought I would give you the opportunity to sum up or say one more thing before we flow into the... Do you have... Oh, I guess I, the only thing maybe I would say, and Len Lenny, you want to say anything? I, I would just say, a reminder to get the book. Yeah. A lot of this wisdom is... Yeah, you know. no, they're, and they're out right out there. So, I, uh, yes, thank you. I also have a daily blog. And my daily blog is called Wisdom Well. And um, if you go to the MEA website, meawisdom.com or chipconley.com, you'll see it there. It's free. And if you, if you get a free subscription, you get an, a morning microdose of wisdom from me. Um, <laughs> so if any of this is interesting, um, yeah, check out, check out the blog because uh, I, I love writing. And I'm telling my dad that every day. These days. <laughs> We're so honored to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.